Welcome into the Train With The Best podcast, a podcast that is bringing high performance to the people. I am Craig Hoffman, a performance coach and media personality. And I'm Chris Gores, international trainer, master presenter. Sorry, master trainer, international presenter. I messed that up. And uh, he hasn't had his coffee yet this morning. That's, That's right. okay. <laughs> That's okay. Our guest today, uh, Chris, is a friend of yours, so I will allow you to do the introduction. Yeah, none other than my guy, Zach Tabrani, who has been working, uh, had, had a short stint with us at Onyx after an internship at Exos, and then well, was invited to do something really cool. I'll let him tell you guys about that. So, Zach, go ahead and take the, uh, take the mic. Yeah, so um, after working for Chris for about five to six months out of, out of my doctorate program, I was able to come across an opportunity to work for um, an MLB player full time um that that's out of houston so i decided to take on that opportunity and uh just explore and experience uh something that a lot of people at my age don't get to um by being a full-time physical therapist uh all around 24 7 365 days out of the year for this individual athlete that yeah. that sounds like a pretty daunting task. So, like, what's the, what's the biggest difference? Because you've you've been around clinics. You obviously did your clinicals. You you were at Excel's for combine training, which is we always talk about, like the Willy Wonka's chocolate factory. You'll never see that again, right? You were here with us, and then what what's the biggest difference when you're working for one particular person? I mean, you know, you uh, as a practitioner, you got to make sure you keep up with your continuing ed and read up as much as you can because you're not touching as many bodies as you would in a regular clinic or if you were working for a team. Um, the biggest thing on top of that is making sure that, um, you know, you're able to communicate with the strength and conditioning staff, the rehab staff on the team and develop good relationships with them so that they're comfortable and trusting of you to work with that athlete. Essentially, that's also part of their um, organization and their job. Uh, requirement to take care of. Um, but I will say the pros to that is developing a relationship with a person. You know, a lot of the times when you're working with a lot of patients or a lot of clients, you get to form some good relationships, um, some good, some bad, but working with one guy, you definitely get to develop a relationship that's more than just a patient practitioner type of uh, interaction and more so a friendship, essentially. Um, and therefore, that kind of helps going forward with uh, trusting my expertise and also coming to a level of understanding that this is what he likes, this is what he doesn't like, what does it take to get this person to feel not only physically well, but also mentally ready to go to go out there to compete. So we all, obviously, with anybody we work with, want to treat them the absolute best that we can. Um, just because someone's salary or whatever um, is higher or it's their profession, it doesn't mean that someone who's a high school athlete doesn't deserve the best care that we can possibly provide no. them. With that said, there's human nature that's involved. And what's it like to deal with the pressure that, like, keeping this guy healthy, keeping this guy going, like, this is his livelihood. And by the way, that livelihood uh, for the player you work with is a pretty good livelihood. You got a good one that you're working with. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So um, taking in all that into consideration, you know, kind of like how I, I like to put things into sports analogies a lot of the time. Um, just because, you know, you're making a living playing the sport doesn't mean you have to do anything different when you're on the court. You still got to love the game. You still got to have fun when you're when you're out there doing it. I didn't get into uh, this profession for the money. Essentially, I got into it because I love sport. I love competing. I love being part of that environment. And I want to be part of a, a journey or a process that I'm involved in to help somebody or help a team reach the highest of the highs, you know, and that's what that's what motivates me every day to give to do the best I can. When it comes to pressure, um, I kind of like not think of all the outside things and make sure that and because, like I said, uh, we have a friendship that makes that makes things a lot better um, when when talking about things because you're not really talking about the outside noise. You're just more focused on what you and that person have going on at that present moment in time. So let, let's talk a little bit about your background and back up a little bit. Like obviously you are where you are now, which is really cool. You've had uh, some really cool stops along the way. But I've known you since you were uh, back in college and, and, and this was just a – just a, a thought, an idea. So let, let's back it up all the way, all the way back to Brent. Let's back it up. Yeah. So uh, I grew up. I was born 
in Hong Kong. I moved to the Philippines when I was six. Ray basically raised there my whole life till I was about 17. Um, I went to a school, like Chris said, called Brent. Um, essentially, you know, a lot of a lot of kids in the Philippines, they pretty much end up going to college either in the country or outside and they end up going back home to just either work. But in my case, I came here to play basketball. Um, I came to IMG Academy to play and then ended up going to college to play at a small D3 school. Um, but then my goal was to go back to the Philippines to play professionally. I had like an agent lined up and everything like that. And then I came across Chris as I was trying to get ready to go back uh, to work out with him. And, you know, after a while, I decided to ask him, should I actually go back or should I stay and pursue um, a career, you know, that provides me with longevity, you know, play maybe play for five, six years and then decide what to do next. Um, but, you know, uh, Chris kind of talked me into the profession. I already kind of have a s interest in sports performance, strength and conditioning and physical therapy. But seeing Chris, you know, a fellow Filipino that, you know, was successful and made his way out here in the United States on his own and established a full facility and a business kind of was a trailblazer for me, essentially. So I decided to go ahead and chase my chase another dream, a new dream with the support of him uh, on my side. And, you know, here we are. Here we are today after a master's pro master's degree and a doctor's degree. And now we're here. Cool. So uh, Zach is also a longtime listener of the pod. So for, for those who are listening yeah. on the pod, like this is this is cool to see. All right. Yeah. It's Fine, funny because like, we entered him. Uh, you know, I, I said, like, Chris, he's a friend of yours. Like, he's a friend of mine, too. Just now people understand <laughs> the depth of yeah. the friendship is a little yeah. bit different uh, for, yeah. for Zach and Chris. Right. Um, yeah. and it's been really cool to see Zach. I remember the first time we met, I think, at one of the Vertimax certs uh, yeah. back, like, probably, oh, God, it's probably been like four Man. or five years ago at this point. Yeah. Um, and, and to see your journey, man, has been been so cool. Um to, when you when you're working with your player and, and it's, you're obviously part of his team, right? And he's mm -hmm. got the team people that he's working with, the team doctor, the team uh, physios, the the strength staff there. Uh, you know, it, it, with with the uh, the baseball team that he's with, and then you've got your own uh, stuff that you're doing with them. How does that interplay work for you in in your situation? You know, Chris has talked about this before. You know, working mm -hmm. with Buffalo staff with Lorenzo, for instance. But for you, especially as as a physical therapist, how do, how does that interplay work? Uh, communication is key. Um, first, developing good relationships with these people, letting them know that your sole purpose is to get your athlete or get this athlete to be able to go out there and compete at their best so that everybody wins. You know, um, if I'm able to do a good job, they're able to do a good job. And therefore, the athlete's probably more prepared to go out there and perform at their best, which also leads to the athlete having a better mindset in terms of trusting everybody in their process. Um, but yeah, communication is, is key. Um, letting them know that, you know, I'm here to help you. Um, let's help each other. Um, get this guy out on that field um, together and keep him healthy throughout the year. Um, making sure that, you know, that you reach out. Don't wait for the strength staff to reach, you, reach out to you or the rehab staff to reach out to you. Introduce yourself. Um, be proactive in what you in the questions that you want to ask and the information that you need to know um, in order for you to do a good job. Um, so, for example, me and the strength coach, um, we try to have breakfast and get together at least once once or twice every month. Um, but we're also in constant communication via phone and and whatnot. And I get his I get his strength program um, for the months for each month or each cycle. And based on that, you know, I let him do his job to, because he, of course, he's an expert at what he does to make sure that um, my athletes out there performing at his best, being strong, being fast. But at the same time, based on what he has planned, I then touch on the things that that they're not touching in the weight room, the empty buckets, because again, volume piles up throughout a long season. But at the same time, in order to actually maintain and stay healthy, but at, but as well as get adaptation, you want to touch on things that buckets that are empty throughout throughout a nine month season essentially to see some beneficial change in your athlete yeah so so let's get into that because i think people when people first of all when people think of physical therapy they think of all the treatment modalities whether it be mm -hmm. cupping needling manual therapy um stem whatever and, and you and i always have this conversation you and i have plenty of conversations for, for those who are listening and, and we talk about those modalities as if you if you crash your car on the side of the road or something is wrong with your car and you break down the side of the road, 
those modalities are the tow truck. Mm -hmm. Those modalities are not the service shop that's actually going to fix your car, Mm -hmm. right? So whether it be cupping, needling, manual therapy, that whatever treatment it is that you select that the the person wants or the athlete wants, the patient wants, that's just a tow truck, right? Mm -hmm. That's not fixing what's really wrong. What's going to fix what's really wrong is movement, learning how Mm -hmm. to move. So what, what have you learned for baseball players in particular, what's the movements that you train to keep their arms healthy, to keep their swing healthy? So, um, just going, just going back to your, your, your initial part of your question. Um, yeah, movement is medicine. We know movement is the cure. Load is actually a cure for a lot of things, especially, you know, muscular wise, but you know, that tow truck is especially important. I, I began at first I was the kind of guy that was like, you know, forget manual therapy, forget soft tissue. Like it's a waste of my time. I'm not going to really focus on it, but you know, taking everything into account, it's, it's a great tool to use in order to get an athlete that ha- that is either fatigued or not feeling great that day to actually get them out on that floor to actually move and actually get results because you can get them out on the floor and force them to move all you want. But if they don't, if they're, if they're not in the physical or mental mindset to get into that session to work on what they need to work on, you haven't done your job. You're not going to get to your goal. Um, so that's first and foremost. Um, so any modality to get them out there, usually I do it by communicating with him what he prefers on that day, what he believes is going to make him get out there to, to move. Um, second of all, uh, things that we focus on. Um, so for the swing, for a, my guy specifically, he's a, he's a big time hitter. So we focus on a lot of T-spine mobility, a lot of hip internal rotation and extension. We focus on those two things because essentially in hindsight, it takes a lot of stress off your low back. Um, there's a lot of torsion in the low back during the baseball swing movement. And, you know, focusing on mobility in the T-spine uh, and the hips and as well as the pelvis can kind of take that stress off that, that low back side. So for the most part, um, so we work for the T spine. We not only work on a lot of rotational movement, but in order to get them to actually start to rotate well through the T spine, we like to work on a lot of T spine extension as well. Um, and then for hip internal rotation, we like to not only get that range of motion, but we also like to control that range of motion because of the swing is as being such a violent, violent movement as well. So control is key. When you talk about filling the empty buckets, like you work with a guy who's a right-handed hitter, how much mm-hmm. do you work on on moving the other way just to try to even out, or is it the kind of thing you just don't oh, really yeah. worry about? No, uh, for sure. So in the off season, um, we we did our off season at Exos in Phoenix AZ, uh, but you know when we were working on our med ball throws and whatnot, because a lot of the time when they're in the cage, they're they're all right sided, they're all swinging and rotating to the left. So sometimes in the weight room, it's good that you involve med ball throws and work on rotation to the other side to help on D cell. You know, in or, in or, if you have strength and power on the opposite side, you're probably going to be able to D cell that left rotational movement really well. Um, and with my guy, he focuses a lot on D selling the bat and D selling his rotational movement because that allows him to have more control within the batter's box, see the ball and also accurately hit the ball to spots that he wants to hit it at without losing control and spinning out in the box, you know? So working on that other side and having control of that other side is especially important in that sense. Cool. What, what about from, from the throwing aspect, like for, for any overhead athlete that, that's yeah. going to be throwing a lot? Because that's, that's the other thing that's a, a very repetitive move, uh, repetitive move in the sport. What, what, what have you learned about training for throwing motions? So um, I'm not a throwing expert by any means, nor am I a pitcher. But, you know, at the same time, looking at the body and how the body works. So let's stop, start from the top down. So first we have the shoulder. Um, shoulder is the first part that a lot of overhead athletes complain about. Um, like we first mentioned, that T-spine mobility is important for function of the shoulder, but as well as your scapula. Um, your shoulder, your humerus, that humerus bone is a ball and socket joint. That ball sits within the glenoid, which is kind of part of that scapula as well. Um, In order for that shoulder to get overhead, you need that scapula, that, 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 uh, that scapula to work well with that ball and socket in order to get that arm overhead. Usually we like to say that 
it's like a one to two ratio. So the first zero to 60 degrees of flexion um, is from the scapula followed by the last 120 being from the shoulder. Um, when looking at that, if you don't have adequate motion of that scapula, you can run into problems when most of that range of motion is coming from that that ball, that socket, that that humerus trying to get overhead. You can cu- you can get issues like shoulder impingement. Um, you can get labral issues. You can start to get rotator cuff issues, stability issues. Um, so with that sense, we like to focus on scapular upward rotation. Um, there are three muscles that do that. You have your upper trap, your lower trap, your serratus anterior. Essentially, um, some exercises that people can focus on are any type of overhead press or a landmine press. Things like TRXYs are great. Um, and even dumbbell overhead shrugs. You know, a lot of people with overhead shoulder pain are like, oh, let's shy away from overhead movement. If you're trying to get them back to throwing overhead, you might want to work on some overhead type variations um, to slowly build their tolerance up to that. So overhead shrugs great because you get to work on that upper trap with your arm kind of in that overhead position. Um, on top of that, um, I also like to focus on uh, some elbow care. Um, we see a lot of pitchers and throwers blow out their UCL. That's a big thing these days. Um, but research shows that there are three muscles that uh, three muscles that kind of protect and stabilize that medial side of the elbow, um, and that's the that's the sh- that's the elbow flexor. That's your wrist flexor. Um, I don't want to get too sciencey here. I want the viewers and, and listeners to know <laughs> uh, what these muscles are. So um, your wrist flexors. Um, it's called ulnar deviation. So it's kind of like your pinky, your wrist. If you're palm up, it's kind of like your pinky going going over to that side of of your hand. Um, that that muscle that does that um, also protects your elbow. Um, and as well as your pronators, basically when you go palm down, when you turn your, your, your hand palm down, that muscle kind of protects that elbow as well. So we work on a lot of things like pronation, supination with, with maces and, you know, go, we go tempo so that they learn how to control those movements and develop some time under tension so that they get some mass in those, in that musculature. Uh, we work on a lot of wrist flexion eccentrics and, uh, as well as, you know, some finger finger flexor eccentrics because that finger flexor muscle also protects that UCL. So uh, we look, focus a lot on tempos and isometrics to hope to then build stability and also build lean mass to protect that, that medial side of the elbow when throwing. We got about 60 seconds left before my phone's going to go off and I have to do I a radio you. hit in Buffalo. But I know that pull-ups... Uh, Curtis yeah. Samuel signed with the Bills. What do you want? Uh, the pull-ups, uh, not not great uh, from some of the research that you've seen recently. Uh, why? What's the, the short version of why that is the case? Essentially, it puts a lot of stress on your shoulder and your elbow already during the season when you're throwing. Um, so we like to go to a variation of like half tall kneeling or half kneeling pull, cable pull-downs. Um, on top of that, the lats are really thick and big muscle that attaches to the posterior aspect of your shoulder. We know a lot of people have... Um, issues going on there. So just clogging up space in that area may also kind of cause discomfort already. Um, and we also want, again, back to the scapula and shoulder relationship. Um, if you have, if you're really lat dominant, you're going to rely on that lat for a lot of movement and control mm. rather than your scapula and your shoulder to do the job of, of its actual job of actually controlling the overhead and throwing motion and deceleration momentum going on in that shoulder that rather than relying on that lat too much. So that's kind of like why I stay away from focusing on pull-ups too much because of the over-recruitment of that lat muscle. Makes a lot of sense to me. Uh, Zach Tabrani uh, working one-on-one with an MLB player, Onyx alum, uh, Exos alum. Uh, Dude, this was awesome. We got a long-time listener of the show. Long-time listener of the show. Great friend of the pod. Of both of us, damn it. That's right. Uh, That's right. (laughs) Zach, we appreciate you, man. We'll have you back soon. Uh, Best of luck uh, with the rest of spring training in the season, and we'll talk to you. Hey, you appreciate it. Before y'all go, y'all can follow... uh, Nemesis Baseball, Nemesis Physical Therapy, Nemesis Strength, and myself, Dr. Zach Pizzabrani on Instagram. Um, we have a lot of baseball content, but a lot of the content on the strength page and the, and the PT page is going to be geared towards your overall athlete and just staying strong and healthy overall. So uh, appreciate y'all for the follow and, and support. You heard the man. Do that. Get smarter. And we'll see you next time on the Train with the Best podcast. Yes, sir. Appreciate y'all. Take care.